Hello, my name is Hassan Sorrells, and this is the Leadership Lessons from the Great Books podcast, episode number 12, with my co-host today, Michelle Stowe. Hello, Michelle. Hello, Hassan. So this is going to be a little bit of a different episode today. We're going to have some visuals intercut uh, with the episode. If you are listening on this podcast, I would encourage you to go check out the video version of it to get the full effect. Um, but today we're going to be reading from the graphic novel from 1985, written by Alan Moore and illustrated by Dave Gibbons, Watchmen. Rorschach's Journal, October 12th, 1985. Dog carcass in alley. This morning, tire tread on burst stomach. This city is afraid of me. I have seen its true face. The streets are extended gutters, and the gutters are full of blood. And when the drains finally scab over, all the vermin will drown. The accumulated filth of all their sex and murder will foam up about their waists, and all the whores and politicians will look up and shout, Save us! And I'll look down and whisper, No! They had a choice, all of them. They could have followed in the footsteps of good men like my father, or President Truman. Decent men who believed in a day's work for a day's pay. Instead, they followed the droppings of lechers and communists and didn't realize that the trail led over a precipice until it was too late. Don't tell me they didn't have a choice. Now the whole world stands on the brink, staring down into bloody hell. All those liberals and intellectuals and smooth talkers. And all of a sudden, nobody can think of anything to say. When we think of the hard parts of leadership, at the tail end of a nihilistic era, we are closing out. I firmly believe in the Western world. The first thing that typically comes to mind is politics, the liberals, the intellectuals, and the smooth talkers. But politics is always downstream from culture, and culture is always downstream from the religious impulse. And it doesn't matter if you're an atheist or a believer, you'll serve somebody, as Bob Dylan once infamously mentioned. And all of us are waiting in the river, up or downstream just trying to find our way. Once upon a time, when the world was still more or maybe less innocent and filled with Archie comic books and maybe some Superman titles on the side, along came a writer with a decidedly sharper take on the impulses, religious and otherwise, that drive people to dress up in costumes and go out into the world to wreak their vengeance upon it. The writer's name of the Watchman is, of course, Alan Moore, and even though he has long since disavowed the very comic book culture he sought to create, his creations, like all genuinely original ideas, have grown their own legs, arms, and minds, and are now fully walking around in the world of cinema, entertainment, and even leadership. Today on the podcast, we would like to welcome a superhero in her own right, Michelle Stowe. For over 20 years, Michelle has been guiding individuals, teams, and leaders uh, through a wide range of organizations to create authentic, equitable, and fulfilling change, producing real, sustainable, proven results. She was born in the U.S. and raised in Germany, and while I, where she also worked for many, many years. She graduated from Dickinson College in Pennsylvania, uh, my former corner of the woods before I relocated to the wilds of North Central Texas, and earned her master's degree in organizational psychology at Columbia University. By the way, that means she's very smart. I didn't go to Columbia. I went to a state college in the Midwest. I mean, it hasn't hurt me none, but Columbia is a good school from what I've heard. <laughs> Following an executive's career at Fortune 100 companies that spanned almost two decades in industries ranging from real estate to pharmaceuticals, she executed a professional pivot to the nonprofit sector, 
where she was chief operating officer of Mercy Housing for 12 years. Uh, a self-described leadership junkie, I'm sorry, leadership development junkie, uh, her diverse experience in the for-profit sector helped stoke her professional philosophy, but it was her time at Mercy Housing where it caught fire. One of the many achievements, Michelle created a comprehensive talent management program for the company's leaders that structured everything from onboarding to succession planning, all wrapped around the organization's core values. Now, there's a bunch of other stuff about Michelle floating around on the internet and on her LinkedIn profile, and you can connect with her in all the ways that you connect with her to help your organization stay on the path. At the end of this podcast, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but right now, she's founded Skyrocket LLC, a coaching and consulting service that leads clients through a dynamic and thought-provoking process. Part of that dynamic and thought-provoking process involves her other passion, which is being a comic book nerd, just like me. A medium she cleverly uses, and by the way, if you work with her, she's going to send you something. You might actually enjoy it. Uh, and she uses this as one of her professional methods for uh, getting across organizational knowledge and delighting her clients and her customers. Michelle lives, works, skis, and hikes in Colorado with her family. So she's also a Denver Broncos fan, which also like unites her to me. And yes, the Russell Wilson trade is going to be terrible for Denver, but we'll leave that for another podcast for another time. Next time. <laughs> it's a 34 year old quarterback. He can't do well. Anyway, uh, welcome, Michelle. <laughs> welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Hassan. I am delighted to be here with you today. And yeah, bringing my two passions together of comics and leadership. Um, delighted. So let's jump in. It is going to be a whole thing. Uh, <clears throat> we were just talking a little bit about it kind of offline a little bit. And uh, this is going to be one of the more challenging uh, technical podcasts that I've done um, because there are visuals that go along with a graphic novel. And for those of you who don't know what a graphic novel is, uh, it is a collection of a series of comic books that bring together one story or one, um, one idea, right? And the key to understanding a book like Watchmen is that it all has to be read as one thing. Uh, it can't really be dripped out over a course of weeks or months. Although when this was initially released back in the 1980s, it was dripped out. And then uh, DC, which stands for Detective Comics, uh, proceeded to release it um, as one graphic novel. And then it took... Uh, it took uh, took storm, right? Took the world by storm. There it is right there. There's the visual. Michelle is holding it up again. For those of you who are watching the video podcast, you're going to want to watch the, <laughs> the video of this. It's going to be amazing. So you're going to hear me clicking around a bit um, in, uh, in this podcast audio. I'm going to try to mute as much of it as possible. Um, however, you will hear me clicking around. Um, go watch the video. You know, that's that's what I would encourage you to do. Go check it out on our YouTube channel. Um, but I will be sharing screen here and reading directly from the panels that are in the books. I will be describing them a little bit and providing some context for them as I read them over the course of the day. So this might make us a little bit unwieldy over the course of the podcast, but I think you'll get the full, the full effect if you're just listening to the audio. So let's get back to Watchmen, Dave Gibbons and Alan Moore. Once again, from Rorschach's journal, this is uh, in book one, page 14, panel one, Rorschach's journal, October 13th, 1985. Slept all day, awaken at 437, landlady complaining about the smell. She has five children by five different fathers. I am sure she cheats on welfare. Soon it will be dark. Beneath me, this awful city screams like an abattoir full of retarded children. New York on Friday night. A comedian died in New York. Somebody knows why. Down there, somebody knows. The dusk reeks of fornication and bad consciences, and he's walking into Happy Harry's, a bar and grill here. A bar and grill filled with, well, the kind of people that would be in a Happy Harry's bar and grill. I believe I shall take my exercise. As Rorschach opens the door. He walks through the bar, meets the barman. The barman says, R Rorschach, how, how you doing, fella? And Rorschach says, I'm fine, Happy Harry. Yourself? 
fine. I'm fine. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad you're fine too. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, oh God, please don't kill anybody. Rorschach says, guy went sidewalk diving Friday night. I don't think he was alone when it happened. Name was Edward Blake, friend of mine. Some wit on the other end of the bar overhearing this, drinking his beer, says, Hey, you hear that? He's got friends. Must have changed his deodorant. Steve, for God's sake, shut up, man. Guy takes a drink. Rorschach walks up behind him. Guy gets up and leaves. I, I, I gotta take a leak. Hey, 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 hey. I didn't mean anything. I uh, I haven't been in the Apple too long, and I, uh, I, uh, hey, what? Ah! Rorschach breaks his first finger. Rorschach turns to the other folks in the bar. I've just broken this gentleman's little finger. Who killed Edward Blake? Ow, oh, ow, oh, ow, oh. All the hoods and the thugs turn to look at him. Breaks his other finger. Yeah! And his index finger. Who killed Edward Blake? Please. Please, we don't know. Oh, God, man, leave him alone. First visit of the evening, fruitless. Nobody knew anything, feeling slightly depressed. This city is dying of rabies. Is the best I can do to wipe random flecks of foam from its lips. Never despair. Never surrender. I leave the human cockroaches to discuss their heroin and child pornography. I have business elsewhere with a better class of person. That's Rorschach's journal. He's a watchman. He's looking out for all of you out there. Oh, and by the way, this, this is not a book for children. Let me be very clear about that. This is a book for adults with adult sensibilities or perhaps teenagers with adult sensibilities. There is tough stuff in this book. And so we're going to start off with the first question to Michelle. Now that we've kind of opened up with Rorschach's journal, <laughs> we did the hard stuff first. We front loaded all the hard stuff in this interview. Um, Rorschach has no proper social decorum at all. Um, and we find out through the arc of the book that he didn't, he didn't begin this way, but he wound up in this space because of trauma. We may talk about some of that today. We may actually get to that. Um, but Michelle, let's start off with this penultimate question from juvenile. Who, who watches the watchman? Who watches a guy like Rorschach? Oh, good Lord. Yeah. So to say that this book was pivotal, um, is an understatement. When we talk about how Rorschach sees the world and how he is a member of this team of Watchmen and how he has emerged in the story, right? It That may have shaped my interest in going into leadership <laughs> development and team building. <laughs> because I think if anyone has ever been on a team ever, you have a sense that each of us comes with our own stuff our own baggage our own way of being and that changes over time right so when we build a team we know our strengths we know our capabilities we know each of us what the, the baggage that we bring emerges as you get to know your team members right and it, for me as i look at this team of watchmen and i compare this to leadership teams coming together it is about building an environment of trust and vulnerability. You have to be able to call each other out on our stuff, on our baggage, and the behaviors that don't support the mission, right? If you're not helping, you're hurting. And how do we call someone out? Well, for those fans of Watchmen, calling out Rorschach will get your fingers broken. Calling out Rorschach will have many, many more ugly things happen, right? And so who watches the watchman takes a brave person who is as absolutist as Rorschach is to be able to call him out on it. And we find that that's hard and very few people are willing to do that. Well, and, and you and I have talked about this offline and we might as well jump into it early. I mean, he's uncompromising throughout the entire book. He won't do a deal, even all the way to the end. I mean, his very last line in the book is never compromise, never not even in the face of Armageddon. And he, he dares, well, not he dares, he challenges, he 
pushes the world's most omnipotent man, and we'll get to that in just a second, a little bit later on, uh, Dr. Manhattan, um, to kill him. And by the way, I'm not spoiling the ending. This book has been around since 1985, and you've probably seen the HBO show or at least watched the Zack Snyder movie, which we'll maybe talk about two of those touch points as well during the course of our conversation here. Uh, so none of this is a surprise. You can go find it online. Um, you know, he he doesn't he doesn't he's unwilling to compromise. How do you, if you're a leader on a team with a bunch of people? where compromise is key because you have to do negotiation. How do you deal with the one guy? And it usually will be a guy who will, who just won't, just won't bend. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think it's interesting. God, I could go down the gender path on this for a while too, right? Sure. Yeah. Go down the gender path. We've got time. (laughs) How, yeah. How, how is it that the unbending, uncompromising, the perception is that this is the men in the room, right? Largely because when there's a female that is uncompromising and unbending, there is so much judgment laid mm-hmm. immediately on that female, right? That it is societally really, really hard to remain true to your values to a point mm-hmm. where you're disagreeing with the whole organization, right? Mm-hmm. With the whole team. But we as a society, if it's male or female, we almost don't know what to do with that unbending, unyielding person. Mm-hmm. And so as a leader, when you have that unbending, unyielding person, right, do you need an organization of activists or do you need an organization of advocates? And Rorschach won't ever be an advocate. That he is to his heart and soul and who he is ethically for his own identity is activism. Mm -hmm. As an organization, it's really hard to know what to do with that person. Right. And so are there individual contributor roles that where they can really serve well, because they're the ones you keep sending into Washington to keep yes. the drum. Is that the person who you put on the writing detail, right? They are your communications person because they will keep beating the drum, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But do you have them show up in community meetings where there needs to be compromise? I would not send Rorschach to a community meeting. I don't think he's going to do well in a community meeting with like the mother who has, you know, five children from five different men. I don't think he's going to advocate for that person getting better, better, better health care. I think he's going to, he's going to, you put him in that meeting and uh, you, you might just, you might as well just have an atomic bomb go off. We're going to talk about atomic bombs too today. You might as well just have an atomic bomb go off. You just might as well. (laughs) Right. And he is, as with many sort of comic book villains and heroes, he is a purist. Correct. And if he could snap his fingers and have the world show up differently, he would. He would. And he, in yeah. his way, is trying to do that, right? Yes. And, and that's, you know, there, there is a beauty to the purity of that vision, but it's also horrifying. Right. And it's right. that unbending, unyielding. And so back to the, what do you do with the Rorschachs on your team? You have to know how to create a lane where they can do well to support your mission and then not do damage. Right, right. <laughs> well, and there's and there's two, I mean, Moore did a brilliant job of dividing up all of these comic book archetypes and attempting to integrate them into some form of reality. Mm-hmm. Um, and he did an excellent job in, really kind of defining how those archetypes would or would not fit into a world that we all live in that is complicated and layered and very often has multiple shades of gray, although there are times when it is sometimes black and white. We have to acknowledge that too. We can't just be seduced by the gray. Um, And so he did an excellent job, um, and Dave Gibbons with his illustrations did an excellent job of visually representing what that actually potentially could look like. And again, this kind of kicked off an era that ended in film, I think, with um, Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight films, um, his Dark Knight trilogy, where, you know, you're kind of, and and you do see a little bit in the most recent Spider-Man movie too, how do you integrate these characters into a world of reality because otherwise it's just ridiculous, which Alan Moore pointed out many years ago. And what I love about Rorschach is different from a Batman, he is very relatable. We're not, none of us are born 
into the kind of community that Bruce Wayne wa was that just walk the earth and just have day jobs, right? right? He was an ordinary person. And what I love David Gibbons's decision to make him a ginger, mm -hmm. right? To have Rorschach be redheaded, the redheaded stepchild, which you still hear that phrase when teams don't feel heard, when people don't feel heard, this idea where I am the redhead stepchild of this team. Right. Right. And so he personifies that. The exactly. Voice that's, that's not heard and needs to be louder and louder and louder to feel validated. Mm -hmm. um, I love it. And it, what I love where Elmore took all this is he wasn't trying to make it clean and tidy. He just jumped right into the messiness of humanity and leadership and power in a way that you know, as, as a teenage kid who had only been reading Archie, this blew my mind. This absolutely blew my mind. And, you know, the copy I'm sitting here right next to me was from high school, right? Each reading of it has meant something different. And even in preparation for this podcast, it means something different because of the richness of it. But that Rorschach role on a team, it, it's powerful and it's so very real. So speaking of roles on the team, let's talk a little bit about human beings on the team because Rorschach can seem a little bit unrelatable, if, but it opens, he opens the book. He sort of sets the tone early. Um, but then you get into book two and we start to meet some other people who are on this team called the Minutemen. And we're going to talk about the Minutemen a little bit here. Um, in particular, um, we begin their introduction at the funeral of a character named the Comedian. Now, the comedian was a complicated guy, Edward Blake. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, he laughed at everything because it wasn't a laugh of humor. It was a laugh of cynical arrogance. Um, and he was the guy on your team, I think. And I think Michelle would agree with this. He was the guy on your team who thought he was so smart and knew everything. Um, but in reality, was just bitter and angsty and knew nothing sort of a nirvana song but with a laugh track underneath it or if you want to go a step further this is what the joker would actually be with all the psychopathy and sociopathy stripped away he would be the comedian and the comedian's death kicks off the book now the comedian had a complicated relationship with the minutemen we'll talk about that in just a minute but let's go to book two page one panel one starts off with this phraseology as folks are going to the comedian's funeral Oh, will you look at her? Pretty as a picture and still keeping her figure. So, honey, what brings you to the city of the dead? Mom, being lazy isn't a terminal condition, so spare me the city of the dead crap. Brought you some flowers. Oh, big spender. Where's John? John's at some funeral. I didn't feel like attending, so he transported me here to California. I just got through throwing up in the ladies' room. Always gets me the same. One second, New York, and next, wham, California. So long breakfast. Poor baby. So this funeral, anyone I know? The funeral? Oh, no, that's just, you know, some little official thing. John had to go. Protocol. They made him put on clothes and everything. It's Eddie Blake's funeral, right? Mom? Laurie, don't treat me like a kid. I can still read. I saw in the paper he got murdered. I guess he finally reached the punchline, huh? Poor Eddie. Poor Eddie. Mom, how can you say that after he almost... Laurie, you're young. You don't know. Things change. What happened happened 40 years ago. It's history. Yeah, well, so's Dachau. I never forgive somebody who did that. Listen, getting old... You get a different perspective. The big stuff looks smaller somehow. In the end, you just wash your hands of it and shut it away. Oh, right, just like that? So what, you want I should curl up and whimper for 40 years? You want I should be a nun? <laughs> Life goes on, honey. Life goes on. Plus, it's a beautiful day, you know. <coughs> you know, you and John ought to move out here for the weather. Was it this sunny in New York today? Uh, yeah. Yeah, pretty, pretty much. Hmm. Well, that's good. <laughs> Lots of sunshine. It's like vitamins. It's healthy. And being healthy is what counts. Never mind all this smart New York living. 
I mean, without your health, where are you? At my age, <clears throat> you want to take care of yourself. All your old buddies have passed on and mom, it's okay. You don't need to open any more doors or windows. Look, I'm putting it out. Okay. It's dead. Extinguished. You know, that just, that makes just three of us Minutemen left now. Me, Hollis, Mason, and poor Byron Lewis in the bug house in Maine. Funny, Eddie was the youngest, always joking about how old we all were. He said he'd bury us. You see, that was Eddie, always talking like he was on top of it, like it was never going to happen to him. He was the comedian. He always thought he'd get the last laugh. That last panel, by the way, ends on the title page with folks gathered around a coffin, staring down at the comedian in situ with the title of the chapter of book two, Absent Friends. The death of the vigilante turned mercenary for government hire. Uh, the comedian drives the narrative of the Watchmen, as I just said, uh, throughout the 12 chapters, culminating in an act of worldwide manipulation that would make the comedian laugh for sure if he had lived long enough to see it. Oh, he would have cracked up. He would have thought that, that was amazing. Um, he stands as one of the twin pillars of the story, I think, Michelle. Um, the other one being the smartest man in the world, uh, Adrian Veidt, who we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and, and this represents two poles, I think, for leaders. Um, one consumed with its own ego um, and intelligence, and the other one consumed with its own cynical pride and all-consuming arrogance. Um, I think these are twin ditches that leaders have to watch out for. I think leaders have to thread the needle on these two um, because they are temptations to fall into both sides, right? When you know too much about things, we see this with <laughs> the wizards of smart who run tech companies, the Zuckerbergs and the Googles and the Gates and the Jobses and the Larry Pages and Sergey Brins and all these folks who are too smart for their own good and are looking for life extension, which it's an irony to me. The only people who are looking for life extension are the too smart people. They're the only ones who are looking to extend their lives. Everybody else is like, you know what, 80 years, I can peace out on this. I don't need to live forever. So that's the er that's the all-consuming arrogance of science. But then on the other side, you have the cynicism of the comedian reflected in people who run, you know, places like Blackwater or places like, um, well, even places who run finance, financial organizations like the Jamie Diamonds of the world. And yes, Bank of America, I constantly pick on that guy because like he opens his mouth and he just outfalls nonsense just every single time he can't stop himself. Um, Ray Dalio is a little bit better, but, you know, I, and I have his book, by the way. I read your book, <laughs> to, par to paraphrase from General Patton back in the day. I read your book. <laughs> so you've got these two twin pillars, right? You've got all-consuming arrogance and you've got intelligence. How can executives avoid these twin traps? How do they thread the needle, Michelle? What do you tell them to do? What do I tell them to do? What do you tell them to do? <laughs> Well, the good news is in my job, I don't do a whole lot of telling. Um, okay, right? how do you direct them? How do you coach them? A lot of holding the mirror up, right? Yeah. To help folks see what is the carnage in your wake by being a leader that is either too smart for everyone in the room or too arrogant and full of pride, right? And so um, I think about Zillow, right? Who thought that it was a brilliant idea for them not just to be this amazing real estate site, but also they were gonna start buying properties because they knew the algorithm, right? <laughs> of course they did, right? They did. And then they built it up and they shut it down, right? Mm -hmm. And so yes, do businesses need to try new things, but know your lane, mm -hmm. know your strength, understand your unique value proposition as a business and as a leader that balance is in servant leadership referred to a lot as confident humility. Hmm. Okay. Knowing what I know, being confident about what I know and what I don't know, that self-awareness is everything. To be able to then surround yourself with the smart people and have the vulnerability and the, the awareness to stay present about who you are. That's that old adage, right? Don't believe your best press, but don't believe your worst press. Right, exactly. This is so important for leaders. And so starting with things like a 360, with things like uh, even just basic personality assessments, 
you have the inclination to be excessively bold. Mm -hmm. And the way to cure that is to shut up and listen. And shutting up and listening is probably one of the best things that leaders can do. And they don't do nearly enough. Is it because of the ego? I keep going back to ego. I keep going back to that over and over again because you've got an ego. I've got an ego. Uh, every character in the Watchmen has an ego. Uh, my kids have egos. Like even my five, my five year old has an ego. I mean, come on, like please. Um, and so he had an ego coming out, <laughs> coming out the womb. <laughs> like he's, you know, welcome to the world. I am Jeremiah. Here I roar. Right, you know, and and we laugh about it on the one hand, right. and when it when it rolls up against the shoals of real reality it causes real problems how do you i mean i know what i and i do tell because that's my ego i know what i advise leaders to do about their ego but how do you michelle how do you overcome that because we're getting ready to turn into adrian vite a little bit talk about you know the world's smartest man here um how do you subsume the ego from my perspective, it is the shut up and listen. Okay. And by that, I mean, not just to your team and the people, the close ins around you that might well be toadying, that might well be telling you what you want to hear because they are legitimately impressed with you. Mm -hmm. You have done really great things, made good decisions to get to where you are, but you're not perfect. And isn't that the beauty of it? Isn't that the beauty of humanity is that we're not perfect and we're always a work in progress. Don't forget that. And the best way to help counterbalance those voices is to have what I call a kitchen cabinet, right? It's your, mm -hmm. your closest in people around you that will call you on it, mm -hmm. right? I, I think about the scene in Moonstruck, a totally unrelated to the Watchmen or comics, right? Where this Italian- No, it's fine. We're bringing in movies too. It's fine. Yeah, bring in movies. <laughs> moment where do you love him? Do you love him? And she says, I love him awful, mom. Right? You need someone who will hold your feet to the fire and say, do you really intend to do this? Do you understand the impact of this? I'm going to hit pause. I'm going to quote another movie. National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Yes. Very end. <laughs> yes. Right? Where the CEO is dragged out of bed by Randy Quaid. Right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> in this fabulous leisure suit, a beast yes. of a man, the wife says in her fur coat, right? Who is dragged into home, tied up with a ribbon, and yep. held to account for withholding bonuses from his staff. Correct. Those are the moments for me where you need someone who can speak the truth to you, and you need to create a space to do that, ideally for everyone. Opening yourself up to that vulnerability of checking your confidence with some humility takes effort and it takes real work because we can all get caught up in the whirlwind of wow i'm pretty great <laughs> so aren't i fabulous <laughs> aren't i amazing and you lose sight of what it means for the rest of your organization you lose sight of what it means for your customers and that's when bad things really do happen they may not happen today or tomorrow but they will happen if that hubris isn't checked can a guy like the comedian check you Ooh. would i trust someone mm. like a comedian to trust to check me because we're, the, the section we're about to go into is is you know the reminiscence of adrian Veidt at the funeral and he's thinking back to and you don't realize this until later on in the book but he's thinking back to when he got the first idea and it was the comedian who was like you're a fool yeah. nuclear weapons are going to destroy us all and then he just sort of, you know, walks out of the room and says, see, in the funny papers, we're going to read that in just a second. Um, which, of course, the whole entire sequence starts with a uh, man that is born of woman hath but a short time to live and is full of miseries. This is directly from the Bible. So Moore is, is playing with two different things here um, in a very, very complicated way, uh, swirling around this guy who is too smart for his own good. Now... You're going to have guys like the comedian on your team or women. Let's not make it. Let's not be gendered here. You're going to have men or women on your team who are going to be like the comedian who aren't really interested in your own self development or your own development. Mm -hmm. They're just interested in making a point. Yeah. 
and they take pride in being the cynic in the room. They right. Take pride in shooting down your plans. Right. Right. They're, they're the ones that are going to. I, I try to raise my children with the idea that because I want them to be future leaders, no one makes you feel anything. You choose your feelings and you, you choose where you go in the world. So I don't, we don't allow that kind of language in our house um, because I'm trying to prepare them for, for the future. Uh, but very often adult leaders will use the term, well, this person made me feel this way or made me feel that way. Uh, and the, the, the thing that will be laid at the feet of a guy like the comedian or a woman like the comedian would be that person made me feel like an imposter. I can hear that just coming out of people's mouths. Mm -hmm. And, you know, something will be posted on LinkedIn and everyone will clap and that person will get 30,000 likes and 5,000 comments and like I'll see it in my feed and I'll go, uh, all right, <laughs> and, <laughs> and then I'll move on. Because you have a choice about what to do with the cynics, right? Mm -hmm. You do have some options, right? What are your options there? Yeah, I mean, his statements are the equivalent of today's clickbait, right? Is he'll say things that, ooh, well, where did that come from? I want to hear more and learn more. And there are some leaders that love doing this in meetings, right? The bomb throwers, the, the shit disturbers, the ones who take pride in saying the thing that is controversial that no one else is saying. And yes, is there a place for that perspective in the room? 100%. Is the way of throwing that bomb in the room, derailing the meeting? No, that, that clickbait works for marketing purposes. It does not work with a team, mm -hmm. but that voice does need to be heard. So how do you again, create a space to hear the voice of the cynic of the skeptic? Because there is deep down, there's a reason they're being skeptical. There's a reason that they want this thing to work or not work. And whatever that is, if they can see it, I mean, SEAL teams, when they work on missions, right? They're doing their sand table exercises, assign someone to be the devil's advocate about why it won't work at every step. And that's why their missions are successful. You need that voice, but you need it in a way that's healthy, productive, mission focused, not sabotaging, right? And that's a, that is a delicate dance. Let's go back to this for just a second. Let's go back to watchman uh book two still in book two page nine panel one talking about man that is born of woman and i and i quote such as it were man that is born of a woman hath but a short time to live and is full of miseries he cometh up and is cut down like a flower he fleeth as if it were a shadow and never continueth on in one stay in the midst of life we are in death of whom may we seek succor but of thee o lord who for our sins art justly displeased. Now, as the panels go on, we begin to do more and more of a close up on Adrian Veidt uh, during his time on the Minutemen as he is thinking back to his interactions with the comedian. This entire sequence takes place in Veidt's memory. Well, firstly, let me say I'm pleased to see so many of you here, very pleased. Secondly, for those who only know me as Captain Metropolis, the name's Nelson Gardner, you call me Nelson, Third, uh, I guess I sh everybody should welcome uh, the first ever meeting of the Crime Busters. And the community, of course, burps. Burp. <laughs> and in the room is Adrian Veidt, Dr. Manhattan, uh, the, uh, Sally, uh, Jupiter, uh, the Owl, Dan Dryberg, and of course, Rorschach. Now, as this meeting continues, some things are revealed. At first, a question that the comedian asks, why the crime busters? Well, as you know, this country hasn't had an organization of masked adventures since the Minutemen disbanded in 49. Specialized law enforcement is standing still, crime isn't. New social evils emerge every day, promiscuity, drugs, campus subversion, you name it. By now, banding together as the crime busters, we bullshit. What? I said bullshit. This whole idea, this crime buster shtick, it stinks. What it is, Nellie, is that you're getting old and you want to go on and play in cowboys and Indians. That That isn't true. And then the owl pipes up. Uh, listen, let's not throw the idea out right away. Me and Rorschach have made headway into the gang problem by pooling our efforts. 
And then Rorschach says, obviously I agree, but a group like this, a group this size seems more like a publicity exercise somehow. It's too big and unwieldy. And Adrian Veidt pops up. Surely that's just an organizational problem. <laughs> With the right person coordinating the group, I think. And then, of course, the comedian pops up at the bottom. Oh, and I wonder who that would be. Got any ideas, Ozzy? I mean, you are the smartest guy in the world, right? It doesn't require genius to see that America has problems that need tackling. Damn straight. And it takes a moron to think they're small enough for clowns like you guys to handle. What's going down in this world? You got no idea. Believe me. Well, I, I think I'm as well informed as anyone given correct handling. None of the world's problems are insurmountable. Which you got in sp All it takes is a little intelligence. Which you got in spades, right? You people are a joke. You hear Moloch's back in town. You think, oh boy, let's gang up and bust him. You think that matters? You think that solves anything? Well, of course it matters. If it don't matter, squat. Here, let me show you why it don't matter. And then, again, you're going to want to see the visuals of this. The comedian walks over to the map of the world, pulls out a lighter, and begins to set it on fire. Hey, what are you doing? It don't matter, squat, because inside of 30 years, the nukes are going to be flying like Maybugs. My display! And then, Ozzy, here is going to be the smartest man on a cinder. Now, pardon me, but I got an appointment. John, I think I'd like to go home now, please. Listen up, Nelson. This isn't working out, maybe. Please, don't all leave. Somebody has to do it, don't you see? Somebody has to save the world. And then back to Vite at the, fu at the grave of the comedian and his memories and the pastor saying, O Lord, most mighty, O holy, and most merciful Savior, deliver us not into the bitter pains of eternal death. That's a heck of a meeting, by the way. Who, who hasn't wanted to light a flip chart on fire? I mean, come on! <laughs> I have sat in so many meetings where I really, can I just go up to the PowerPoint and just, just, just tank this whole thing? <laughs> what are we doing here? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I love this scene with every bone in my body because it is so incredibly relatable. And I think the beauty of the irony of Alan Moore setting these superheroes up in a conference room with a flip chart <laughs> <laughs> with a guy who's got an agenda and he all wants us to play our roles. Let's clarify the ground rules. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah, let's all, we all know our roles. It's an organizational problem. Surely we can solve this. And what are we doing? <laughs> We're number one. We're all dressed up in costumes. Let's right. start with that. <laughs> Pretending one like us, we don't know who each other are. Right. <laughs> one of us is glowing, omnipotent, and full of nuclear energy. Yeah, right? yeah, and it's fine. We're just standing here down downstream from this guy. He might be giving us cancer, but it's fine. Okay. It's all good. <laughs> well, and it it puts paid to this idea of at the low the low resolution comic book level because there's multiple resolutions of this that Moore is working with, but. At the lowest resolution level, it puts paid to the idea of like super teams, like Avengers or Justice League. And everybody buys this because of the movies now. I mean, we're 35 years away from, from actually probably 40, closer to 45 years away, or not 45, sorry, 40 years away from Watchmen. And we now live in a movie culture. Comic book culture is now driving, driving movie culture, it just is. You can't find a mature movie for a mature audience that doesn't involve somebody dressed up as a superhero doing something. Like even the John Wick films, you have a guy who's a regular human being doing things that a regular human being couldn't possibly do because we have no room in our conscience, which is something that Moore brought up in his critique of mass market superheroes. Uh, we have no room in our conscience for just an average person dealing with average things and watching that for two hours. Because we, we, we can't buy it now because we've been trained over the last 15 years that these super teams are going to come together and you're going to have a guy in an iron suit. I mean, let's be real here. You're going to have a guy in an iron suit. You're going to have a guy who's hopped up on super steroids who can run real fast. You're going to have a guy who hops around like a spider, a radioactive spider, by the way. Hmm, okay. Uh, probably putting off radioactivity. And you're going to have a guy who's dressed up in a Black Panther outfit who's the king of an African country that no one heard of until about 10 minutes ago. 
And we're all just going to go, yeah, that makes sense. Fighting a guy, by the way, who is looking for a gauntlet where he's just going to snap his fingers and everybody's going to forget all of it. Right. Because he is so affirmed in his conviction that this will solve the suffering of the galaxy, of the galaxy, not just humanity. Right. Right. And, and what I love visually about the panels in that meeting is that that three panel that you just showed of where the comedian decides that he's going to speak up is his body goes the length of the three panels, mm -hmm. which for me is just beauty and messaging because when there's someone in the room that's about to blow up the meeting, mm -hmm. they make themselves very apparent and present for the duration of that meeting. Yes. So even though he hadn't said anything yet, his cynicism is skepticism. It's electric and it's already getting in the way. Yes. I love these panels so much. <laughs> and yes, this may be why I do what I do for a living it, and I'm maybe facilitation. And it's like, <laughs> I love this. I love this because you see it happen, right? It's so real. And we look at that level of distraction that that creates, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah, it's remarkable. It's remarkable. Let me show you another panel. Um, let me share another panel from book two again um, towards the end, page 27. Let me share another panel with you here, uh, which I think is, again, brilliant because there was one guy who didn't get invited to the party. He didn't get invited to the funeral. That was Rorschach. He was in the initial um, the initial crime busters uh, meeting there, uh, but he didn't get invited to the funeral, which is an irony worth speaking of just by itself. And uh, there's a whole entire sequence at the end where it shows uh, the person, uh, well, not the person, several people taking a crack at the comedian. Um, the first one going back to um, the, uh, the 1970s in Vietnam when the comedian uh, 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 raped a, uh, or not raped, impregnated a uh, Vietnamese girl, and then she cut him in a bar with a broken bottle. And intercut with that is the scenes where uh, the comedian is drunk. Uh, the comedian is uh, getting beaten up before he gets thrown out of the window, which I'm not going to tell you who threw him out of the window, but somebody finally got their vengeance on the comedian. Uh, and, uh, and it's intercut there, and Rorschach is thinking of a joke. And so let me just read you these panels. Again, if you're listening to this on the audio, Go and get a copy of The Watchmen. Look at the visuals. If you're watching it on video, go and get the copy of The Watchmen and read the whole book. Uh, from from uh, pay, book two, page 27, panel one, Blake understood, treated it like a joke, but he understood. He saw the cracks in society. He saw the little men in masks trying to hold it together. He saw the true face of the 20th century and chose to become a reflection of it, a parody of it. No one else saw the joke. That's why he was lonely. I heard a joke once. Man goes to the doctor, says he's depressed, says life seems harsh and cruel, says he feels all alone in a threatening world where what lies ahead is vague and uncertain. The doctor says treatment is simple. The great clown Pagliacci is in town tonight. Go and see him. That should pick you up. The man bursts into tears, says, but doctor, I am Pagliacci. By the way, as a result of this book, I went and got the great play Pagliacci, the great opera, and listened to it. Pagliacci is the clown who cries because his wife is cheating on him. Mm. I love that joke, by the way. Seinfeld did a whole bit on it <laughs> back in the day. I love that joke. Because, again, it's one of those things where the irony layers upon the irony layers upon the irony. And you're giving like eight different messages there inside of what is it seven panels mm -hmm. the visuality of dave gibbons and the visual ability to represent it and then of course to be able to handle a complicated script with complicated material like alan moore's uh writing here is just uh, is just tremendous what can leaders do to avoid getting distracted from the mission vision focus and values of the organizations when stuff shifts around them. Because one of the things that you see in book two here <clears throat> is how the world shifted around the Crime Busters and the Minutemen. I mean, even Nelson is talking about it in the initial meeting. Again, a man with good intentions. 
who wanted to save the world but didn't realize he was outmanned. He was outmanned by the people in the room. Uh, I think of the movie Ronin. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen that with uh, with uh, Robert uh, De Niro back in the day, where he uh, he ambushes a guy just with a coffee cup and like a couple of questions. <laughs> Anybody can be ambushed in any kind of way. Oh, and by the way, the chapter ends with a quote from Elvis Costello, and I'm and and I'm up while the down while the dawn is breaking, even though my heart is aching. I should be drinking a toast to absent friends instead of these comedians. And each one of the chapters ends with either a quote from a lyric in a song or uh, a quote from a poem or a quote from a philosopher. And we'll get into Nietzsche here in just a minute because we're getting ready to turn into Dr. Manhattan a little bit here. But what do you, what can leaders do to avoid getting distracted as like all the black swans? And we live in a world of black swans right now. I mean, we're recording this in 2022. I don't fundamentally believe we're on the back end of COVID. I fundamentally believe that there's more surprises for us. Um, we've got the Ukrainian geopolitical mess, which we're not going to talk about, but it is ironic that we're talking about Watchmen in light of when that was written during the time of the Cold War. Um, Russia has reared its ugly head yet again. Um, we have gas prices going through the roof. Uh, it seems to be a weird combination of a return to the 1970s with all of the bad stuff from the 1980s. And of course, we all have the internet and social media, so we can all see it immediately versus three weeks from now. Ever learning the truth, but never really, or ever gaining knowledge, but never really knowing the truth, right? And we're going to revisit that idea again. What do leaders do in these times? What, what do we do? How do we get yeah, right? <laughs> I just asked you the, the power question there. I put it in the middle of the podcast. How do, what do we do here? What are we doing? I mean, I started a podcast to try to deal with it. How do we deal with it? No, it's a, it, it, <laughs> but for all the knowledge in the world, right? I, I feel as though, and we go back to that Pagliacci scene with the comedian. There are voices for leaders to hear from a variety of sources. And I think the challenge in not being distracted is to understand how and when to listen to all of those voices and to not let ourselves get so focused, disenfranchised or exhausted, right? Mm -hmm. That we can't hear the value in the voice that the comedian did bring mm -hmm. because he did predict the future. He did. Mm -hmm. And he in fact set the dominoes in motion, motion that resulted in where we ended up at the end of the book. Mm -hmm. How could leaders have heard that perhaps differently even when the voice and the, the source is unsavory and some of them we might question their ethics, right? That's a great, that's a great point. I, I wrote a blog post years ago and it's a, it's a thread of an idea that I've never really followed up on, but it seems to be, it, it's, you're, you're referencing it right now. And it's this idea that it's not just leadership. I think it's followers too. Mm -hmm. We only like the voices we like and the voices we don't like even though they might be telling us things we need to hear. Mm -hmm. eh. We'll just kind of throw them out of the bathwater, right? And you're seeing this, I mean, I mentioned COVID, good Lord, without getting into the politics or the science or the, anything around COVID, because that's not the point of this podcast. I don't care what side you come down on on any of this. <laughs> and it's not you, it's the general audience. I don't, I don't, I do not care. Don't email me with your opinions about this. <laughs> don't bother me on social media. We can all agree, I think, that there are multiple voices in this cage around COVID. Mm -hmm. And some voices are given more weight than others. And we live in a world of increased, as we just mentioned, democratization of voice. And so when you do that, every voice goes, I have equal weight, whether you like me or not. And if you start shutting out those voices or shunting them to different places because you want to preserve a dominant narrative, whatever narrative that is, I think you fail as a leader. I agree. I agree. And creating a space at the table for a diversity of voices and being intentionally about it, it there's, there's this wonderful beginning to meetings that I'll facilitate with boards that are just starting is are the people in the room the right people in the room who's missing? Whose voice is not here? 
And that has to be how we start. Because if we're going to be discerning how we achieve a mission, how we achieve a goal, how we develop a product, whatever it might be, you need to build your senior team, your board, your advisors in ways that have all the voices. Well, and how do we avoid eating our own, like believing our own media? That's totally right. That's totally right. Because it's very, it's, it's attractive and it's intoxicating to hear I'm right. Oh, we love those moments, right? <laughs> the thing I did was right. The declaration I made, the product I released was right. Well, maybe that time, but some of that is luck. Some of that is timing. It might not all be because of your genius. So right. let's take a breath <laughs> and take a minute and acknowledge that there still need to be contrarians. There need to be voices in the room that don't always agree with you. I find the yes. best boards are the ones that invite contrarians to the table. When we invite contrarians to the table, they're either going to come in the form of comedians and that's they're right. going to come in the form of Rorschach tests. <laughs> no, that's right. Um, or they're going to come in the form of, and I want to talk a little bit about Dan Dryberg. Um, Sweet Dan. Dan is what Bruce Wayne would be without Batman. Without Edward, Albert. Without, with, 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 yeah, yes. <laughs> I got the name wrong. <laughs> it's okay. It's all right. No, people have to go read the book. They'll figure it out. Um, he is, he's, but that's why, that's why Rorschach and the owl are separate. Yes. Because what Moore did, again, is he separated out the, the Batman persona, which is Rorschach, from Bruce Wayne, the man, which is the owl. So the owl has money and the ability to do all this stuff and yet is, to use our modern terms, a beta male right. inside of a space that he doesn't really understand. Uh, so he's got money, but no, no clue. He's got money and he's clueless. Rorschach has no money and thinks he knows everything. <laughs> Uh, but even he only has a part of re a, a handle on a part of reality and the part of reality he has a handle on. You well, know, you're going to have to go look at the book. You can determine for yourself if it's a good handle or a bad handle on reality. I'll just say he thinks he has a handle on a certain part of reality. And when you separate out Batman into those two pieces, it becomes real complicated because Rorschach with no money is basically wanting to running around with hoodlums, but the owl with money doesn't have the, the chutzpah. I was going to say wherewithal, but chutzpah works. Absolutely. The chutzpah to ha cre <laughs> create a relationship with a woman. He's not driving the relationship with Lori. Mm -hmm. Ms. Juspeck, which we'll talk about her in just a second. Mm -hmm. He's not driving that relationship. She's driving that bus. This was also written at a time when feminism was in its second, getting to the cresting at the end of its second wave and getting into third wave feminism. And Moore didn't really touch too much on this. And this is one of the knocks against the watch, one knocks against Watchmen is that the female characters aren't fully developed. You see this also as a knock against Christopher Nolan and his Batman films. Christopher Nolan doesn't, and Jonathan Nolan, the brothers, they don't know how to write women. Uh, okay. But I, I, I don't, very few men know how to write women. I, I think of the line in As Good As It Gets from Jack Nicholson. <laughs> When, when the fan, because he's a you know romance novel writer, and the woman walks up to him and goes, "How do you write women so well?" And he goes, "I think of a man, and I just take away all responsibility and accountability." And that is a brutal line, <laughs> and you laugh in the movie, and then, of course it all comes back to bite him in the butt in that film, in that film, um, through the form of um, the former host of Talk Soup. Can't remember the guy's name right now, <laughs> but it all comes back to bite him in the butt, right? Um, and he can't create a relationship with a woman because he actually doesn't know how to write women. And that's the irony of that line, right? Um, Dan Dryberg. How does a guy like that land in a world like this? How do you operate if you have money and, and progressive good feelings, but you don't have chutzpah. Right. Think about 
because he said all the right things to Lori. He said all the right feminist male. He's one of those guys who's driving around with a I'm a male feminist bumper sticker on the back of his car. Like he just is. Right. On the and back it's fine. Of our, Archie has <laughs> like ironically named Al um, a little aircraft that he to, he flew around in. He is um, he is unbelievably passive and aimless. Right. right in this story compared to a whole host of characters that are very focused with good direction right about where am i headed he's mm. not he's lost he's in many ways there are leaders who are elevated into roles that don't have a clear vision of who they are and where they want to take the organization they were seen as the heir apparent or someone liked them or they're thrust into the role for some other reason, a family run business, right? Or a family run foundation. And you see then that the people around them are the ones that are actually making the decisions. They were, they were promoted above their weight level, which is something that I'll say, you were promoted above your weight level. I've said that about certain, certain postmodern presidents, you were promoted above your weight level. You couldn't actually handle that thing. Yeah, and there's, there's the reluctant leader who does have good leadership that is thrust into it suddenly, the field promotion during battle, right? Mm -hmm. Or Cincinnati at his plow. Yeah, yeah. Right. right. <laughs> and, and then there's the reluctant leader who really has no interest or vision. And so, you know, leadership narrative is something I work with leaders a lot on. You have to know where you're going. A leader is only defined by followers. Mm -hmm. Dan has no followers. Rorschach comes by to basically mock him, diminish him as a male, a superhero, and just a person and say, God, you're useless. I'm just going to walk. I'm going to leave here on foot because you're so useless. You have a flying owl and I'm just going to walk away from you right I'm now. I'm just going to walk. I'm just going to walk through the tunnel here. <laughs> That's how useless you are to me and to society, right? Mm -hmm. And that, it, it to me, it helps to highlight the power of having a leadership narrative, knowing who you are, what you stand for, and why you're in the job. He doesn't know why he's in this job. He has he no clue. No. So he's just going to do what the people around him suggest and say, and he might worry and wring his hands a little bit and fret, but then he'll do it because he doesn't have his own direction. He doesn't have his own path. And it's interesting that, well, I want to talk about Lori and Dan's relationship uh, yeah. very briefly here before I share screen here. It's interesting that at the back end in the, the, sec the end of the second act and then going into the third act, their relationship becomes uh, the driver for um, Dr. Manhattan to engage with the earth for about a split second before he goes, right? And you're left at the end of the book wondering, not wondering, no, 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 no. If you've ever been in a relationship or a marriage of any intimate kind with any other human being, people hate to say this out loud, but you know how Lori and Dan are going to wind up. You just do if you've ever been with another human being. Yeah, there's a glimmer of a hope, but they're going to break up because Lori liked Dr. Manhattan at first and stuck with him for a reason she met him when he when she was 16 years old mm -hmm. he formed her way of looking at relationships and the world mm -hmm. and she uses dan and uses is the correct term here to excise that from her and it ain't gonna work because you always go back to the thing that formed you i'm sorry you just do whether you're a leader or you're intimate relationship or you're just a human being floating around. This is why formative experiences are called that. They're called formative because they form you. That's right. And she clearly is working on defining her path. Right. Right. Throughout the book, however wayward it seems she's meandering. Towards the end, the meander begins to have more purpose and intention for her. Mm -hmm. She's being more decisive and sweet, poor Dan. Is just not being more decisive. And so to your point, those, those paths, this is a nice moment that they're having. And then they'll wish each other well, shake hands and walk away. And walk and away. That's, that's great. Well, right? no, no, they won't shake hands and walk away. She'll walk away down the tunnel and he'll go back and hang out in his owl glider. Shrugging <laughs> his shoulders and going, all right. Yeah. Why don't I have any friends? Why am I alone here in this basement? Yes. 
sweet Dan. Sweet Dan. Sweet Dan. Let's mm -hmm. uh let's take a turn and let's talk about uh let's talk a little bit about Dr. Osterman. One of the more tragic figures um in Watchmen. Book three, page eleven, panel one. By the way, this is when you begin to learn a little bit about the door it begins to open up a little bit on Osterman and what he has become. As I said, book three, page 11, panel one. Oh, so Dr. Osterman finally arrives. Nobody thinks to tell me. Marvelous. Duh, don't blame me. I only just took over reception and he just appeared. I feel sick. They're not paying me enough for this. They're not paying me enough to handle monsters from outer space. You haven't left us time for makeup. That blue is far too light for television. Dr. Osterman, I'm Forbes Army Intelligence. Here's a list of no-go areas. Obviously Afghanistan. Well, rise, but play it cool. And try not to get into tight corners. Is this dark enough? My God. Oh, uh, well, yes, yes, yes. That's just perfect. That's certainly dark enough for my purposes. If the Geneva talks come up, the official position is that they can resume until they can't resume until the Soviets agree to exclude you from the agenda. Shh, we're on. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we're ready to start. And believe me, we have something really special for you tonight. In his first ever live question and answer session, let's have a big hand, please, for Doc Manhattan himself, Dr. Jonathan Osterman. John, I hope you'll forgive me for asking you this, but huh, what's up, Doc? Ha 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 Up is a relative concept that has no intrinsic value. Uh, right, okay. So let's get into the questions over there. Doc, if the Reds act up in Afghanistan, will you be prepared to enter hostilities? As far as I know, there is no situation in Afghanistan currently requiring my attentions. Okay, fine. Uh, now, how about you over there? Yes, sir, you. And please, let's try to keep it snappy. Dr. Osterman, I'm Doug Roth. I write for Nova Express. I wonder if you remember Wally Weaver back in the early 60s. The newspapers called him Dr. Manhattan's buddy. He died of cancer in 1971. I believe it was quite sudden and quite painful. I remember Wally as a good friend. I attended his funeral. Really? How about Edward W. Jacoby, also known as Moloch? You encountered him several times during the 60s in battles, conflicts. Whatever it is you super people do... Did you know that Jacoby also has terminal cancer? Moloch? No, no, I didn't know that. I'd rather not. What's the matter, doctor? Don't you like this line of questioning? Am I starting to make you feel uncomfortable? And how about this one? Did you know that Mrs. Jane Slater linked romantically with you in the 60s is currently suffering from lung cancer? Doctors have given her six months to live. Notice any connection? Because from where I'm standing, it's starting to look pretty conclusive. Janie? But I, I wasn't told. Are you suggesting? Okay, that's it. No more questions. The doctor's tired. Sorry about this, folks. But the show's over. Also, we have reports of more than two dozen other past associates similarly afflicted. Dr. Osterman, Tina Price from the Washington Post. Are these allegations true? Come on, let's get out. The mob's getting aroused. Doc, I'm Jim Weiss from the Inquirer. Tell me, do you, what, do you think you gave Miss Slater cancer by sleeping with her? No, please, if you'll let me through. Let him through. He's not here to answer questions on intimate moments. How does it feel to know you may have doomed hundreds of people? Please, if everybody would just go away and leave me alone. Gentlemen, I think it's the safest not to pursue this line of thinking. Dr. Manhattan, how often did I said leave me alone? And then the last panel the television studio, the cameras, the cameramen, the army intelligence guy, and everybody else are transported back to their homes, including the studio audience and all the media. And the world's most omnipotent nuclear-driven man is standing alone in a room. In page 16, panel one. Talk about leadership narratives and the media. Yeah. That was a perfect sequence of how the media actually works. 
not chasing the truth, just chasing a narrative. Mm -hmm. But doing it with the wrong guy. They misunderestimated, mm -hmm. <laughs> to use a George Bush word, Dr. Manhattan. You mentioned that leaders have to know their own narratives. Um, and we live in a social media driven world now that people of the seventies and eighties and nineties couldn't have imagined if they wanted to. I mean, hell, I graduated high school in 1997. I had no idea that all this was coming. Um, and they thought back then, if you go back and listen to what they said then about the media, that it was invasive. And it's reflected here in the sequence. The media was invasive, tone deaf, chasing sensationalism, and less focused on getting to the truth and getting an agenda across to an audience. And now we've just, I would normally say doubled down. We've actually quadrupled down on all of that. And leaders who are media organizations in their own right today um, are driven towards performing for the audience of the algorithm rather than the audience usually that they seek to lead. Uh, and the danger, of course, lies in disconnecting from that audience, like Dr. Manhattan, and causing unintentional damage um, when called out <laughs> on their nonsense and their stuff. Um, is there any value to be driven by what the audience says it wants? Because the audience that was surrounding Dr. Manhattan wanted electric cars and dead people in Vietnam and dead people in Afghanistan and the Soviets under the thumb. That's what the audience was telling him. So he gave them what they wanted. And yet it wasn't enough. I, I think of the song from Magnolia. You got what you want. Now you can hardly stand it. <laughs> what do leaders do when the audience says, oh, that's what I wanted. And you give it to them. And now they don't want it. They reject it. Right. And sometimes... The old adage, it seemed like a good idea at the time, right? Which is all the beginning of all bad, all bad ideas to begin with. It seemed like a good idea right. at the time. And it used to be with leadership communication with the media and with the outside world, you know, well, whatever you say, you don't want on the cover of the New York Times, mm -hmm. right? Whatever right. you put in writing, whatever you put in print, be careful because you don't want the New York Times. Well, mm -hmm. we're far past that. To your point about quadrupling down. Anything communicated internally, anything communicated in a conversation that might be recorded now becomes fodder for this expectation of not just what a leader communicates, but what an organization communicates, mm -hmm. right? In the 90s, we got really excited about leadership brand, right? Lee Iacocca kind of primed the pump for this in the 80s. And then it, you know, what's your leadership brand? Yeah. What's the messaging going to be? What are you about? That to me is different than leadership narrative because now you are saying to the world, I am this and I am mm -hmm. great. And I will act consistent with these following values anywhere I'm hired as CEO because I'm that amazing. Mm -hmm. But when your audience is saying, we need you to have a comment about Black Lives Matter. We need you to have a comment about COVID masking and vaccines. We need you to have a comment about what's happening in Ukraine and Russia and you're getting those demands from your Ukrainian employees. You're getting those demands from your parents of children in schools wondering about vaccinations for their children. You're getting those demands from your African-American and black employees saying, we need you to have a voice here because I need there to be representation from the company I work for. Those demands from a leadership and corporate communication have never been as loud, as clear, as constant as what's now being demanded of companies. And so now we're seeing unionizing efforts, partly around pay and benefits, but also just about values and morals. The, the ask right now of leaders is almost impossible in so many ways, because at the end of the day, is it really shareholder value that I'm here for? Is it how I do the business as much as what I do? Is what I'm saying going to come back and bite me because I am I going to comment on every single act of violence that happens in this country? What's too much and what's not enough? Oh my God. I, I, 
it is an impossible challenge for everyone who grew up thinking they knew what PR and marketing was. I said, leave me alone. <laughs> I, mean, I said, you. leave me alone, you TikTokers, you YouTube influencers. <laughs> Can I just snap my fingers and you go away? Go away. And go away. When I reread that panel, it's interesting, right? My first inclination was, oh, he killed them all. He killed them all. They're all dead. <laughs> and you know what? It's it's fascinating because I was I was the chief operating officer at Mercy Housing during all of that noise in the tw in the 2020 era. Mm -hmm. And there were moments when I was like, can I please just snap my fingers and just have a moment of silence? Because I I don't know how to respond to all this right now. And I can for leaders, this is untenable in many ways. The thoughtfulness it's required is just next level and it's next generation. Some of this is about having the fluidity of being able to say, okay, where do I stand and what do I comment on? And being okay with it being day to day, not month or quarter to quarter. The chapter ends, I love everything you've said, and the chapter ends with the quote from Genesis chapter 18, verse 25, when uh, Abraham is bargaining with God, which is a great chapter. This is why we do this podcast, because there's great things in the old things that actually can help us now if we were just interested and curious enough to go find them. And Abraham's bargaining with God over Sodom and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And this opens up book four, which is about Dr. Manhattan, which we're going to talk about book four, which is the most break heartbreaking chapter, I think, in all of Watchmen. Um, for how Dr. Osterman became what he became. Anyway, Abraham's bargaining with God over Sodom and Gomorrah. By the way, the first time that a human being in Genesis actually attempts to negotiate with the eternal. Interesting point there that you all may want to take note of. Um, and Abraham asks God, and again, look, this is the quote that ends the chapter, uh, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? right yeah. if you're cosmological and you're eternal and you're omnipotent and omnipresent and omniscient and i am not that's a great question that's a fundamental question now of course in the arc of the bible if you actually go look and read the bible the arc of the bible is jesus answers that question in the new testament that gets answered in the New Testament and it's just an arc forward and you have to read the whole Bible to get the actual answer, um, which I have done several times, by the way, as a leader, I do believe you have to read the foundational documents to actually understand what's going on in society and culture. Whether you believe in an existential being or a cosmological being is another question altogether, but actually knowing what's in them and understanding the foundation is critical and key to leading. I think it's also critical and key to understanding that you can't answer on everything. And we ran into this as an organization, as a consultancy in 2020 uh, and in 2021, uh, we were pressured to put out something about Black Lives Matter by our clients and audience. And I looked around at my team and I said, a very diverse team. And I said, we're actually living those values. I don't feel any, com I don't feel compelled to, 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 to write a statement I feel more compelled to live them, to visually represent them. And I'm not going to uh, change my LinkedIn profile to put a flag in it or a fist. Uh, I'm not going to change my Facebook profile to show social solidarity because the organizations that tend to do this, you talk about big corporations where I see the hammer beginning to fall the hardest is on medium sized and small sized businesses the 50 employees or more, the 100 employees or more, the 500 employees or more. The big boys will figure this out. They're already running towards the corporate communications PR into this because they have staffs of 500 that can afford to do this day in, day out all the time. I don't have a staff of 500 running PR for me, and I may have Ukrainian employees, and God bless them, I feel bad for them, but I don't have 50 people to comment on the Ukraine. We need to get work out the door. Mm -hmm. And if that means my audience runs away and that means my customers run away, I don't know how leaders in those SMBs are going to respond, but that's where the hammer is going to start falling the hardest. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? 
the word right is problematic. Oh, it is. And that's why Abraham mm -hmm. set that word up. That, that's why that's what that's what human beings ask the omniscient and the omnipresent and the omnipotent. And if you're going to step into that role, well, there's responsibilities and consequences, right? To come along with wanting to be in that role, right? And that's where clarity of what we do, mm -hmm. why we do what we do and who we are is so important for an organization. If what we do is lending to nonprofit enterprises that are serving educational needs in cities, mm -hmm. then let's do that really well. And right. let's have that be the impact that we have. To lose sight of your mission is actually to then not serve the community that you're serving mm -hmm. and starts to veer from, in, in my belief, starts to veer from right. Mm -hmm. To do right is to do what you say you're going to do, right? And with that as a communication vehicle, then to decide when is it appropriate for me to comment on something and when isn't it? If I have Ukrainian employees, yes, it behooves me to be communicating with them directly, mm -hmm. right? If I have employees who I know are struggling with their concern about how they're showing up and a feeling of belonging in an organization based on their skin color or gender or ability, yes, that's my responsibility to now create a space where that works for them. But am I obligated to comment on absolutely everything that's happening? I, that is asking too much. It's a road too far, in my opinion. We don't, I don't think we have the bandwidth as leaders. I just don't think we do. Plus, uh, you know, I think of uh, what Gandalf said to Frodo down in the basement uh, when they were in the Fellowship of the Ring, when he's rocking the ring through uh, where the dwarves were and they're getting ready to fight the Balrog and Frodo in the movie. Uh, it happens a different spot in the book, which, by the way, we'll cover Lord of the Rings next year. Anyway, <laughs> can't, can't do it this year. Uh, we'll cover Lord of the Rings next year. Return next year in March for Lord of the Rings uh, on this same channel. And we may invite Michelle back and talk about that. <laughs> but, um, you I'll know, Fro Frodo says to him, I wish none of this had ever happened to me. I, I wish the ring had never come to me. You know, I, I wish I had not lived to see such times. And... You know, Gandalf says, well, and this is a bit of wisdom. All wish such things who live to see such times, but that's not for them to decide. The only thing you have to decide to do, is, or the only thing you have to decide is uh, to do well with the time that's given to you. That's it. Uh, we read a letter from Birmingham jail, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. He said, you know, the bad people use time better than the good people do. That's it. That was his great fear. I think he's right. I think that that's a bit of wisdom. I think that that's the obverse of Gandalf or Tolkien, if you want to frame it that way. Um, we good people have to use time well that they are given. And if using your time well means making a space for your employees to actually live out their whole identities, don't worry too much about a Black Lives Matter statement or a Ukrainian statement or a COVID statement or a mask statement or a, don't worry about those things. And make the space because that's your, I think I agree, that's your accountability, that's your responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. And ultimately, that's where your voice should be then, consistent with those actions, right? And not yeah. trying to solve for everything because then you'll just end up solving for nothing. Speaking of the man who's solving for everything. Um, so Dr. Manhattan transports people uh, back to their beds <laughs> and then transports himself to Mars. Um, and while on Mars in chapter four of Watchmen, he reminisces, he thinks back to history. Now, this is an interesting chapter and incredibly complicated um, as a read. Uh, doesn't really translate to the audio here of the podcast. Again, go pick up the visual copy of The Watchmen. We are not reading all of it. We are just reading selections. It is way too complicated to read all of it, and we don't have time. Um, <laughs> so go pick up a copy of the book. Um, but as we turn, as we make our turn to close here in our conversation with Michelle, and Michelle's done a, done, done a great job of bringing her insights and everything else here to, to this conversation today and her passion for this book. Um, I would say that this chapter for me is again the most heartbreaking one in the book um, because Osterman just wanted to be a watchmaker. 
Book four, page 25, panel four. It's later, Lori is walking out on me. On a rooftop on the past, I pull her 16-year-old body to me, breathing her perfume, never wanting to lose her, knowing that I shall. Later still, and in the crowded TV studio, I am being accused of killing those closest to me. The word cancer runs through the audience on a firecracker string of anxious whispers. I am tired of this world, these people. I am tired of being caught in the tangle of their lives. In Arizona, I'm entering the ruined bar with a sensation of deja vu, and I'm taking a snapshot from its broken frame, and I'm gone, gone to Mars, gone to a place without clocks, without seasons, without hourglasses to trap the shifting pink sand. Below me in the sand, the secret shade of my creation is concealed, buried in the sand's future. I rise into the thin air. I am ready to begin. A world grows up around me. Am I shaping it, or do its predetermined contours guide my hand? In 1945, the bombs are falling on Japan, the cogs are falling on Brooklyn, seeds of the future are sown carelessly. Without me, things would have been different. If the fat man hadn't crushed the watch, if I hadn't left it in the test chamber, am I to blame then, or the fat man, or my father for choosing my career? Which of us is responsible who makes the world? Perhaps the world is not made. Perhaps nothing is made. Perhaps it simply is, has been, will always be there. A clock without a craftsman. I am standing on a balcony of pink sand hardened to glass. It glitters in the ten-minute-old sunshine. The light of two hours past will be just reaching Pluto. If they have strong telescopes there, they can see me, the photograph in my hand falling, lying in the sand at my feet. I am standing on a fire escape in 1945, reaching out to stop my father, taking the cogs and flywheels from him, piecing them all together again. But it's too late. It has always been. It will always be too late. Above the notice Gordai Mountains, jewels in a, makeless, in a makerless mechanism, the first meteorites are starting to fall. The chapter closes with a quote from Albert Einstein, which I once had on my Facebook page, in which I reference and I change the term atomic power to internet power. The release of atomic power has changed everything except our way of thinking. The solution to this problem lies in the heart of mankind. If only I had known I should have become a watchmaker. The release of biological power has changed everything except our way of thinking. The release of the communications power of the internet has changed everything except our way of thinking. The release of the soon-to-be mass release of artificial intelligence will change everything except our way of thinking. I'm not too fascinated with the gee whiz stuff anymore um, at this point in time in my life. I mean, it's cool and everything, but the reason for this podcast is to pursue wisdom and fundamentally the truth the things that we have forgotten, the things that we need to embed in the heart of mankind. Um, I cannot see all time the way that Dr. Manhattan can. Things don't happen for me in the past, the future and the present, all at one time, all of the time, every time. But they do for him. That's the definition, by the way, of omniscience. <laughs> I am not omniscient. And I am not omnipresent, and I am not eternal, and neither are leaders. If the solution for this problem lies in the heart of mankind, and if the heart of mankind is irredeemable, as the old books say, or if it's not irredeemable, as the Rousseauians on forward in our culture and 
society, particularly our Western society, have been banging the drum on for about the last three to four hundred years. If we're not irredeemable, if it's society that makes us bad. <laughs> What do we do with all this knowledge? What do we do? And this is, this is, this, we're, we're, we're going to close here a little bit on this because we're kind of, kind of turned the corner. We cannot possibly cover the whole book. And Michelle has been gracious with her time um, and her insights. Um, and maybe we'll break this up into two parts and come back and do a little bit more on this because there's, there's so much here and we've been talking for a while. But on this existential note, because Nietzsche hides at the bottom of some of this, and I talk about this in the chapter on Rorschach, where you gaze into the abyss and beware, it gazes back into you also. So that's, that's the obverse of Albert Einstein's idea here about being a watchmaker. Um, Dr. Manhattan asks the question, I mean, a watch without a watchmaker. This is an ancient, well, not ancient, but this is a 500-year-old idea. You know, God, and Thomas Jefferson believed this. This is what the deists believed. God turned on a watch, put it in a field somewhere, and just walked away. Doesn't care about us. And never did. And never will. We make the world. Yeah, but. There's always a yeah, but. There's so many things that happen to us that have literally zero rational explanation in the course of our lives that we cannot chalk up to the rationality of a watch or even the rationality of a watchmaker or the irrationality, sorry, of a watchmaker, just winding it up and leaving it in a field somewhere. So that philosophy doesn't work. It just doesn't. And Nietzsche knew this. He said that we killed God, but that there wasn't enough water around to wash the blood from our hands. It wasn't a triumphant statement as many atheists frame it. It was actually a sad one. And his struggle at an existential level was to try to figure out how human beings could create their own values out of their own selves. And he died early. That wily German with the good mustache. He died too early. He never figured out the answer to that question. And then his followers just took the first part, the God is dead part, and ran with it. The Derridians and the Sartrians and the postmoderns. And now we're here. We're here in the West where we can remake our own biology. That's part of what the transgender movement is really about it's about remaking our own biology to match what we believe it's also where we are going with cybernetics and artificial intelligence i've seen what boston dynamics is up to over there with their robots that move and it's going to make what happens in a black mirror episode look like child's play we're on the cusp of doing some really hyper dangerous things and we haven't figured out the human heart. Matter of fact, we don't even seem to be curious about it. I am deeply troubled by that. And I don't know how to solve that problem. And I can't go to Mars and make a smiley face. No. So no. what do we do as leaders? Because because quite frankly, the leaders who listen to this podcast, and I say this very often, are are the most innocuous people possible leading in revolutionary times. And every decision that they make does matter. It does reverberate across time. If I had gone to argue with Dr. Manhattan, number one, I wouldn't have argued with him. I'd been like, well, you already know the answer to the question, so just send me, send me to the next step in the process. I'm not even gonna bother having the conversation. <laughs> what do leaders do if they are in an innocuous space and they just believe, well, I just, you know, I just make decisions about my nonprofit and then I go home and I eat my, my lunch and I play with my kids and I go to bed and I wake up and it's wash, rinse, repeat. It's Groundhog Day. It doesn't matter. Yeah. So where I'm jumping in is <laughs> all of that. I know. It was a lot at the end there, at the, oh, at the yeah, turning. Cool. And I'm going to choose where I jump in. Yeah. Um, choose where you jump in. It's, I, I gave you a ton of stuff there to work with. Did. And, and I have to say that I believe that science fiction and fiction in general has helped us try to struggle with this for centuries, mm -hmm. right? Our thinking about what we do with our intelligence and how technology plays a role in that. Um, you know, it, it bears a lot of fruit and it warrants us thinking about what the message is there. 
And I'm going to parallel that with when we need big change to happen. We start with the burning platform. We start with why. Why do I need to change? And science fiction tells us time and again, until to serve man, right? Until the aliens come, we won't unify as humanity. Or I love your phrase, mankind, right? Humankind. The word kind. I don't know the etymology of this, and I'm absolutely going to look this up when we're done because. The purpose of that is to say we are more than our basal instincts. Yes. We can be more. And why, why are we not at times? Why did we spend our time building medieval torture devices in medieval Europe to harm bakers for not baking bread that was large enough? Why did we create tools of torture rather than use those tools to, to further medicinal pursuits. Well, we did. It was one and the same, but what we remember is the horror, mm -hmm. right? And so, mm -hmm. you know, back to Dr. Oppenheimer, right? Mm -hmm. This was not a journey to create mass destruction. No. It, it ended up being that for the purposes of power and greed and dominance. That's where this all lands. And so how do we as humans take that next step to go beyond ourselves and look at ourselves as humankind, we have a long, long way to go in that journey. And so what I see as the role of leaders in that is the burning platform, creating a clear vision of how we all benefit and why we must change, whether it's climate or pandemic or war or whatever, the clarity of what is it that we do and why and to the benefit of the whole and all boats rise. That, to do that is our challenge. Need, oh yeah. And to do that, I think we need statesmen. Yes. I think we need fewer politicians and political solutions. I fundamentally believe that the bureaucrats won't save us either because they're focused on different things. Uh, the politicians are, <laughs> to paraphrase from War Shark, uh, the smooth talkers and the backslappers. Yes. And those folks aren't going to save us either. They're not wired to. And besides, that's not their focus. We need states people, but we need them at the, at, again, at the most innocuous level. The role of leadership toolbox and leading keys in our products that we deliver here at HSCT Publishing for folks to keep people on the path is to get people to realize that the power lives in you, mm -hmm. not in Google, mm -hmm. not in Facebook, mm -hmm. not in the podcast you're listening to, mm -hmm. not in the book you're reading. The power lives in you. Mm -hmm. And the journey you have to go on as a leader mm -hmm. is the one that will save the world. 100%. I w my only add to that is and bring others with you. Yes. Support, mentor, and lift others up on the way. Uh, there's an old expression, a candle does not diminish its brightness by lighting other candles. That is our role as leaders, is to take our light and light others. But we have to know our light first. You're absolutely right on. Yeah. So there's our easy solution to the exit. That's right. <laughs> we just solved that crisis. All right. Done. Next. Check mark that box. <laughs> we can move on to other right. things. Now I can move on to solving other problems. Like, oh, I don't know, splitting the atom. I can move on to that now. <laughs> Absolutely. Watchmaker, here I come. Oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah, it would be simpler to be a watchmaker. And I, and I do know many watchmakers personally. It would be just be simpler to be a watchmaker because you just you put everything together and you go home and it just works. Yeah. It just works. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank Michelle for coming on today. Um, it was a it was an extensive conversation. We did not nearly cover all the points in the book. Matter of fact, if some of you are watching on video, you saw me take a few pages of the script away because we just we just did not get to some things. Uh, the book is complicated and deep. Um, there are tons of leadership lessons and insights from this book. If you read it deeply, um, it is layered and it is adult and it is complicated and it is 
for mature audiences. And it is the thing you should be reading. It is not kids stuff. If comic books ever really were. As a close, I would like to say that leaders cannot just not lead. You may come away from reading Watchmen and going, well, just throw up our hands because it's just too complicated. No, 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 no. Um, many, many times because of position, status, time spent in the organization, or just good old fashioned power, uh, leaders are thrust into accountabilities that they did not ask for and may not want to take on. We talked about this with Dan Dryberg a little bit. But there's another part to this, which Michelle, Michelle brought up, and I want to piggyback off of in our close here. There's followers. There's very little advice or books written about how to be an effective follower. Uh, and the culture of the United States of America, which comes from a Western culture built upon almost 2,500 years of struggle to define the individual against the collective. Michelle talked about bakers being tortured for baking bread. That's just one example of the individual struggling against the collective in the Western world. Talk of followership is a non-starter very often uh, for many organizations and teams. And yet even leaders follow. In Watchmen, the comedian and Dr. Manhattan followed the directives of the state. The owl and Rorschach followed the directives of their investigations. And the Minutemen and the crime busters followed the directives of their egos. <laughs> And yet, there is no good advice for any of them. There's no light shining in the darkness of mere being, as one of the quotes is in the book. There's just a happy face on the surface of a red Martian landscape with no more meaning behind it than it being a happy face. The search for meaning and how to define it for leaders and followers is the point of this podcast, as I mentioned several times in our conversation today. From the books we read to the observations we make, Yes, tactical practicality matters in the day to day, but for those tactical considerations and plans to at least have a chance or a hope or even a prayer, if you are a praying person, of actually accomplishing the leadership goals and vision that leaders want, the order must begin with leaders knowing who they are, why they're leading and defining clearly the meaning of their actions and decisions before they make them, not after. This construct of leadership must be revivified generation after generation in what Clark Kent, a well-known journalist from the Daily Planet, would call the never-ending battle. <laughs> Bruce once said, Clark was right. It is a never-ending battle against the forces of evil, and principalities and powers, and the rulers of the darkness of this world. And if you want to stay on the path, I think as a leader, that's what you got to do. And that's it for me. Michelle, what would you like to promote today on the podcast? Once again, I'd like to thank you for coming on. I'd like to thank you for your insights. It was a great conversation. I had a great time. What would you like to talk about with our folks today? How can you help them stay on the path? God, what do I want to promote? World peace? Can we start there? <laughs> Oh, with everything we've talked about today, I want to thank you so much for having me on this podcast. I, what a terrific conversation, and I'd certainly be delighted to keep this conversation going, you and I, with any of your listeners. Um, you know, when I'm not chatting with you about comics, I'm working with nonprofit leaders, executive leaders, and their teams to find their own inner superhero. And to our conversation today, find that burning platform. How do we communicate in a way that helps our leadership narrative be true and clear and then deliver outstanding results, right? Um, so a few plugs today to help yeah. leaders do that. Um, I've launched a speed coaching event um, that the first one will be April 20, 2022. There will be more. My hope is to do this twice a year where we will be bringing together nonprofit leaders and coaches for free. So for a free one hour of coaching. So gratis, not a focus. My Ozymandias level plan here, got to keep plug in Watchmen, um, is intended to shake up this trope of nonprofit leaders not having access to high quality leadership and professional development, mostly because of budgetary constraints. There are solutions, there are organizations, there are coaches that are available and willing to work with organizations and meet them where they are. And it's out there. 
right? And my goal is to help debunk some of that trope with this speed coaching event. Um, so come find me on skyrocketcoaching.com to learn about this event. Um, and starting additional group coaching cohorts uh, for leaders that my goal is to also help accelerate their professional development. Um, ultimately, you can all find me at skyrocketcoaching.com um, and would be delighted to introduce your guests as well to the uh, Skyrocket comic book coaching tool. Um, so yeah, a big fan of this medium and really have appreciated the conversation today to highlight the depth of leadership opportunities and lessons that you find in books like The Watchman. So thank you, Heysan, appreciate the time. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Michelle. And we will have links as we always do in our show notes below the show player uh, on any of the podcast providers. That's right, right below the doodly doot as they infamously said back in the day. Uh, we will also have these links below uh, our YouTube channel where you will be watching this podcast, uh, the video of this. So we will have links to skyrocketcoaching.com. We will have links to Michelle uh, and all of her social uh, connections that so you're able to get a hold of her. All of that will be below the show notes, which will be below, be below the player in your uh, social media, or not social media, I'm sorry, your podcast player platform of choice. As far as us goes over here at HSCT Publishing, there are many things we've got to keep you on the path. We've got obviously the podcast, we've got our Leading Keys Solution, which is our platform for leaders, um, our SaaS-based platform for leaders. We've got our webinar products, we've got our remote live training services, we've got our Leadership Toolbox product, which you can check out at leadershiptoolbox.us. If you would like to hear more, obviously, from this podcast, you should be liking and subscribing Leadership Lessons from the Great Books and telling your friends, because where else are you going to get insights like this over the course of a couple of hours about things that seem like they're kid stuff, like, you know, comics, or maybe heavier stuff like Dostoevsky, or Hemingway, or Jane Austen. Like, where are you going to get that, right? You're going to get it here. You're going to get the wisdom and truth that will make your heart better even as your technology begins to outstrip you. We also have a couple of books in case you like that old technology. So I wrote a little red book that's now a little red podcast called My Boss Doesn't Care. You can check that out in our podcast network as well. It is a bi-monthly podcast. That means twice a month. We release it. It's highly produced and I think you'll enjoy it. Finally, we've got 12 Rules for Leaders, the foundation for uninten of unintentional and intentional <laughs> leadership. I kind of butchered the title there a little bit. 12 Rules for Leaders. This is our upcoming book. I wrote it, uh, co-wrote it with a guy named Bradley Madigan. Uh, so you can check that out. Our pre-order list is live at leadershiptoolbox.us. You can go click around under the tab that says Books and join the pre-order list. That'll be coming out uh, here in April. Um, and then, of course, if you just want to book me for speaking, um, if you want to hang out with me, you can go to HeySanSorrells.com and check me out. Uh, we also have another podcast. It's kind of a side project called the Hayson Sorrells Audio Experience, where it's all of the stuff that doesn't fit underneath the banner of Leadership Lessons from the Great Books, or My Boss Doesn't Care, or the other podcast, which is Leader Buzz. Go check out the Hey Sansarell's audio experience. That's where I get interviewed by other folks or other folks interview me or I interview other folks. And I go there and I dump all those podcasts there. You can subscribe to that as well. Finally, you can check us out on YouTube at the HACT Publishing channel. Uh, we have like 19 subscribers there. I hope that I'm amusing all 19 of you. But as you listen to this, you should go subscribe to the YouTube channel, okay? And you should download the videos. You should pay attention to the video podcasts that are there and all of our video products. Once again, I would like to thank Michelle Stowe, Skyrock Skyrocket Coaching, for coming on today and talking with us about Watchmen. It was a great conversation, and we did not nearly cover all of it, and so there will probably be a part two of this. I'm going to try to arrange that in just a second here as soon as I say, hey, son, out. <laughs>